a word of prayer. Father, we declare in this place that you reign. Boy, that makes life a whole lot easier to know you on the throne. We got a lot of craziness going on in this world, Lord, but I'm so glad nothing surprises you. Nothing catches you off guard. God, you can take what the devil meant for evil and turn it around and use it for good. So, Lord, let, let us experience your glory, your presence here today. Let us experience your power. Remind us, God, that you can turn it around. It may look dark tonight, but Sunday morning is coming in our lives, and we thank you. And so have your way today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, let's bless God one more time together. Amen. Amen, amen. I, I um, want to go ahead and launch into this new series, The DNA of Life. That's been our theme all year, The DNA Delivered for Noble Activity. And so I want to come back to that a little bit and close out the year, preach a series of sermons, and, and God just kind of took the reins off and said, just go, just go. And so we'll see where the Lord leads us today uh, as he... Um, ministers to us, and I believe um, he does have a word for us, and this is a concept um, I believe in very strongly that I want us to get and how important it is, and maybe it'll give some kind of framing to what we're even going through right now, amen. But I'm so, I'm so proud of you to, to not let a tornado keep you from coming to church. Amen. No, I really am. Give yourselves a hand clap of praise. I really am, Amen. He said, I'm going to the house of the Lord. David said, I was glad when they sit on to me. Yeah. Some folk are mad when they sit on <laughs> Let's go to the house of the Lord. But they were glad, and you were too. And so I want to look at this passage of Scripture, familiar to many. Uh, it's in John chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, and verse 14. It says this, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, say witness testify about the light so that all might believe through him. And then verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh or became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. And I want to talk about glory today. You, you need God's glory for life. You need God's glory for, my, for life. In this text, John, the writer, just gives us a little bit of information about his experience with the living Christ. And he wants us to know that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you love the Lord, you can experience his glory. You can engage his glory. Text says that we just read that he said we saw his glory. Probably a more fitting translation would be, we beheld his glory. In other words, John says, when we walk with Jesus, we embraced his glory and his glory embraced us. When we, when we walked and watched Jesus, we touched his glory and his glory touched us. And it raises the question as followers of Jesus, how do we experience this glory? If my grandmother were here, she would say, we need his glory because the power is in the glory. And I think that's what John is trying to say this morning. He's, he's trying to help us understand our faith. Our faith is more than some rules. Our faith is more than just going to church on Sunday morning, and there's a place for that. Our faith is more than some of the religious traditions in which some may be good, some may be bad. But our faith is about walking with a God and experiencing his glory. And if the glory shows up, how many of y'all know the power will show up? That's what we need. That's what we need. We need God's power. And so in this text, he, he kind of shares that, and it's kind of reminiscent of what happened to Moses when he came off that mountain after he had received the commandments. And the Bible says that his face shone brightly because he had been touched by the glory. Reminded of when Jesus revealed himself on the Mount of Transfiguration to Peter, James, and John. 
and he pulled back his flesh and revealed his glory and they experienced the glory of God because as my grandmother would say, we need the glory because if the glory shows up, the power will show up. And it really raises that question, how do we experience this? We need that power because when I got the news about the church being hit by the tornado, I said, Lord, we need your power. We need your glory. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes God allows these situations to let us know that faith can never be confined to a building, but faith is an experience. And if our faith is tied to what denomination or what building we are part of, we've missed the glory, y'all. But does anybody know as long as God is with me, I got the power, I got the glory. And every now and then the glory of God will show up in a unique way. And so for some, you were hit by that tornado and you're powerless. And God's word to you today is that God still can give you the glory. He can give you his glory and give you the power to overcome. It is the power of the gospel that whatever tragedy comes your way, God can conquer it with triumph. But some of us are here today. We've got all kind of different tornadoes coming at us. Maybe your tornado was not what happened on Monday or on Sunday night, but we all have our own tornadoes, tornadoes in our families and tornadoes in our finances. And some of us work for a tornado, amen, and married to a tornado, say amen, and can't say ouch. <laughs> And, and we're dealing with our tornadoes and we need to know, do, can God give us the power to deal with our tornadoes? And I'm simply saying, if the glory shows up, the power will show up. I met a man Wednesday night uh, when I was uh, helping a friend out. I was sitting at home and kind of down on myself. I said, the church can't do ministry, can't do this, can't do that. And I'm kind of having my little pity party and Good friend of mine, Vincent Parker, he called me, and they're doing a series on church hurt. He says, you sitting at home anyway. Come on over here and help me do this thing. And I said, Lord, you're so gracious. You know how to pull your servant. So he pulled me out of my little pity party. And so I'm having my little pity party about what I don't have and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of that service, if I had a chance to minister about church hurt and all those kinds of things, a man came up to me, and, and basically he was saying, Pastor Archer, I'm so glad you're here today. He says, because I really was done with church. I was done with God. I was done with the whole thing. And he began to tell me his story and all that he had gone through and endured with family and with church members and things like that. And I began to share. I said, you know, sometimes it's in those situations that God can show up most powerfully. And after I finished talking to him, you can see that he had a little pep in his step and he felt that he can keep going on. Not to me, but God's power moved. And in that moment, as I got in my car and thought about it, I said, you know what, Lord, if the tornado hadn't hit the church, Parker never would have called me and I never would have been there to minister to, some, to minister to somebody that needed some help. And sometimes, y'all, God just has a peculiar way for how the power shows up. Don't let the tragedy in your life lead you to think that God is not doing something. I came to tell somebody, he'll use the tragedy, he'll use the tornadoes to turn it around to use you in such a way where God's glory and power shows up in a dramatic way. And so what I want to do today, I want to look at this text this morning and just kind of help us capture what it means to behold God's glory and to experience his glory. Because when the glory shows up, the power of God will show up in our lives. Number one, here's the first one. Glory always signifies God's greatness. Glory signifies God's greatness. And that's what we see in this text, particularly from the opening in verses one through three. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning uh, with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Here we see the greatness, the deity of Christ, and we see how great that he always was and always will be. And it speaks to the fact that God is great. No matter what we go through, no matter what the challenges are, it's not a surprise to God. God has great purposes, but we can always lean on his greatness. 
When I'm feeling small, God is still great. When I'm feeling broke, God is still great. When my body's not right, God is still great. No matter what I'm going through, when the devil is busy, God is greater than the devil. No matter what we're going through, we're reminded that God is great. And his greatness shows up in this passage. Deuteronomy 10, the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty awesome God. He's great. The Lord is great in Zion. Psalm 99 says he's exalted above all the nations. God is great at all times. David said it like this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In other words, when I really understand the greatness of God, it'll show up in my worship. It'll show up in my praise. That if I believe God is great, I'm not going to give him patty cake and lip service. But then I'm saying I serve a lip service God. But does anybody know my God is great? My God is awesome. And if my God is great and awesome, he deserves great praise. He deserves awesome praise. He deserves the loudest praise that honors and gives him glory. David says he is worthy to be praised greatly because he is great. Interestingly, there's a Hebrew word that describes this greatness. It's kabod. It's the glory of God. That's the word that is most often used for his glory. The, the Greek equivalent is doxa, which also means glory, and it means heavy. It means someone who is extremely wealthy, someone who is extremely powerful. And so when the Bible talks about the greatness of God, here's what it means. His glory and his greatness means that God is not just great in one area. He's great in all things. He's, he's great in every imaginable way that we can think of him. And so when we think of greatness, we may think of LeBron James as being great as a basketball player. Or we may, be, we may think of Denzel Washington as being great as a great actor. Or we may think of the former president, President Obama, as being great as a great politician or being great as an oratorical speaker. When we think of greatness, maybe we think of greatness of Jeff Bezos, who is the wealthiest man on the planet. Or maybe we think of Robert Smith as the wealthiest African-American in this country. And all of them are great in their own right, but usually they're great in one area. But when we talk about the greatness of God, he's not just great in terms of his grace but he's great in terms of his mercy he's great in terms of his presence he's great in terms of his justice he's great in terms of his kingdom he's great in terms of his holiness there's not an area in God's life that he's not great so what is the area that you need God to show up he's great as a healer he's great as a friend he's great as the righteous judge he's great in every single area in my life. God is great, church. He's great. He's great. He's great. And it causes us, when we look at our situation, not to think that it's the end, but that God is doing something significant behind the scenes. God is changing it around. God is turning that thing around. And sometimes God's got to wreck it before he can raise it up. Y'all not hearing me today. One dark Friday, Jesus hung, bled, and died on a cross some 2,000 years ago. He had to wreck it first before he can raise it. And sometimes the greatness of God shows up in our lives that he will allow it to be completely leveled before he raises it back up. And so as I began to survey all the damage that was going on at the church, and I looked at the roof in which the power pole had collapsed on the roof, and I saw all the damage. I, I got down, y'all. I got down because this is the ministry that God laid on my heart. When I looked at the poles that were twisted and I looked at the trees that had been snapped and I looked at large rocks that looked like they weighed some 60 to 70 pounds that had been moved 10 and 15 feet, I started to get down and look at the situation differently. And then God began to speak to me and say, Autry, it's all how you look at it. And God began to minister to me. He says, don't forget what you're looking at. You're looking at the 
outcome of the tornado. You weren't there to see what the tornado did, but what you're seeing is, is the effects and the outcomes of what the tornado did. So can you imagine when I come through and do my work, can you imagine the outcomes and the effect that I can do that sometimes I got to wreck it before I raise it up? And God sent me to tell somebody today, I know it's a tornado that's gone through your life, but sometimes God has to wreck it to raise it up, to make it as great as he wants. Hold on, child of God. God's not finished with you. Number one, he's great, and he does things in great, mysterious ways that we don't always understand. But God can use it, and his presence will show up and give us the outcome that will benefit us in the long run. But then number two, here it is. Glory signifies God's presence. And we see that in verse 14 when he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And for all my Bible scholars in the house, you know that word dwelt is an echo to the time when Israel dwelt in the wilderness. The word literally means tabernacled amongst us. And it speaks to the time when Israel wandered in the wilderness uh, and, and they built this tent called a tabernacle and that was the place and the habitation of God's glory, the Shekinah glory. So it's a word about how God is with us. His presence is with us to preserve us in the midst of our wilderness. And many times we want God to step in and do it and he can do that. But there's more witness there's more power to hold us up in the midst of it rather than to bring us completely out of it. It's not that God is against us, but God says, I can get more glory keeping you sane in a crazy situation. I can get more glory to stand you up that's knocking everything, everybody else down in the same situation. I'll preserve you and keep you with my presence. And so one of our good members here uh, suffered loss recently, and I was talking to him last night on the phone as we were sharing and talking about the loss he had, he had recently endured. And he told me, he said, Pastor, I got to be honest with you. He says, now that I've gone through this, I, I don't know what folk do that don't have God in their life. I don't know how they handle challenges. He says, I'm not hating on anybody. I'm not dogging anybody. He says, but sometimes you're going to go through some stuff that's bigger than you. And I need somebody that's bigger than me that can keep me sane in the midst of it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Has God ever done that for you? You don't know how you got through it, but somehow he kept you through the midst of it. That was the presence of God in our life. And so let me just give you some pointers very quickly how God's presence shows up in our life. Number one, he shows up in prayer. This is all under presence. He shows up in prayer. And prayer simply means we connect and communicate with God. I know we kind of take that for granted, but here's the word I want you to get with prayer. Prayer is about intimacy with God. It's about having intimacy. Prayer will give you insight into your situation because we live in a day in which people have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. And let me tell you something, knowledge will not get you to where you need to go. Matter of fact, some knowledge will get you in trouble. <laughs> but we're living in a day where we need wisdom. And, 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 and if you pray about it, anybody ever pray about something? God gave you insight into what was really going on? And so prayer will give me insight. But then prayer also will give intervention. Because sometimes, you know, God will not step in unless we ask him to step in. Sometimes God uses trouble to determine whether God is a spare tire <laughs> or whether he's in the driver's seat. <laughs> and the truth is, sometimes it takes trouble to really learn how to pray. Many times people ask me, Pastor, how can I learn to pray? Just wait for the trouble. The trouble is the best class. <laughs> that class will teach you how to pray. And many times it's in the trouble that we discover God is in the trunk like a spare tire. And God's letting us know, I'm not just in your life to be your fan. I'm in your life to drive your life. I want to be the one that directs your life. And so many times he uses prayer to develop intimacy. And we live in a culture, church, that can talk about all the sex they can have. But do they have intimacy? And you can't have intimacy with somebody unless you have conversation with them. And for some of us, that's where God has us. It's a time to know that you can talk to God. Don't need a preacher. Don't need a priest. 
There's a place for church, there's a place for ministers, there's a place for pastors, but this is a relationship in which God will use certain situations in our life to get us to have conversation with him. Tell your neighbor, he's working on my prayer life. Number two, I would say you engage God's presence with scripture reading. One of my professors from Dallas Seminary, he used to say, when, when we open this book, God opens his mouth. And, and when we want to engage the glory of God, the presence of God, it happens with prayer. But for some of us, it's a scripture reading issue. We, we need that word every single day. I can't go a day without his word. And I know that as a pastor, I'm supposed to do that. I'm telling you as a Christian, I get my strength, I get my fuel, I get my hope. Listening to God's word, hearing God's word, letting God speak to me in the morning. And so 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God breathe. When you open that book, God will breathe on your church. When you open it every morning, you won't, you won't have to look to somebody else to breathe on you and to inspire you. God will give you the inspiration you need for that day. Psalm 1, 2, he says, he delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And look what it says. And he shall be like a tree firmly planted. Because when the storms come, guess what? You'll stand strong. Because you've been in that word every single day. You've been meditating on, it, on his word and he'll give you strength and stability. Isaiah 40 and 8, the grass withers, the flower fades. But what? The word of our Lord stands forever. And you want to know why some people are here today and gone tomorrow. They're not standing in the word. And maybe that's what God is saying for the glory and the power to come down. We need his word, 1 Peter 2 and 2. He says, like newborn babes, we're to long for the sincere milk of the word. And I think the problem is, y'all, we're we trying to get all of our eating done on Sunday morning. We fast for six days. Don't eat anything. And then y'all want pastor to feed you a 50-course meal on Sunday morning. I ain't doing all that. You got to learn to feed yourself. You got to learn to go to the Lord for yourself. Now, you ought to expect a word on Sunday morning, but every now and then when Tuesday comes, you got to know how to get in God's word for yourself and hear God's voice for yourself. Because he'll keep your mind right. I, I didn't understand it. The old folks, you say he'll keep your mind sane. But when you're around some crazy folk, they'll make your mind crazy. And you, and you need God's word and his strength to keep you sane. If you want to engage God's presence, his glory, it's in his word. But then also it's worshiping. You're here today as a bird is to air and a fish is to water. So we are to worship. Here it is. Worship is where we engage the supernatural. Listen to me. I want you to get this today. Worship is where you engage the supernatural. Because here's what you've got to understand. And, and Solomon was right when he says he's put eternity in our hearts. Listen to what it means. It means that the only satisfaction in my heart comes from a supernatural source. And the problem today is with Christians, we're looking to everything but God to make our hearts whole. And the more we chase it, the, more, the emptier we become. There, there's this nagging emptiness on the inside. Not, nothing wrong with having fun, nothing wrong with all that stuff, but when I make that my end in life, it leaves me empty. But something happens when I fall before the supernatural. Something happens when I fall before the great I am. He knows that on the inside, there's eternity that can only be satisfied by him. And so C.S. Lewis was right when he said the fact that nothing in this world satisfies us means that we were made for another world. We were made for something significant. And really, this is a word about God's presence amongst his people and the whole issue of worship. There's a place for the individual worship, and we ought to do that. Matter of fact, I grew up at a time that you brought your worship to church. And you came through the door. You were shouting on the parking lot because you knew worship was about coming to the end of all the worshiping you've been doing all week. But we live in a day now where we got to bring the worship to the people. <laughs> And it speaks to the fact that maybe we don't have that individual worship going on, but you got to understand where God wants to dwell. He wants to dwell in community. He wants to dwell in the midst of his people. Matter of fact, when you look at the word glory and the glory and the presence of God, you will rarely find in scripture where it's simply on one person. 
Even when it fell on Aaron uh, during the priestly anointing, it was at an ordination service in which God's people, brothers and sisters, had come together. Oh, how good it is when brethren and sister, and that's an archery translation, gather together in unison. Equal opportunity, sisters. Okay? When he fell in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, Exodus 40, that was in the midst of community. When Solomon prayed and dedicated the temple in the Old Testament and the Shekinah glory fell on that place, that was in the midst of community. When the Spirit of God came in Acts chapter 2 in the form of the Holy Ghost, there were 120 believers gathered together, which Paul connects to in Ephesians 2 and says, this is the new temple and the people of God is his new holy habitation. And make no mistake, in Revelation 21, when he sets up the new kingdom, we will dwell around him. Why? Because the glory is what makes heaven heaven. And every time the people of God come together and God's presence touch down, y'all, we've already been to heaven. I don't have to wait till I die to experience some heaven. Every time we come together to seek God's glory, God is the one that makes heaven heaven. And that's where his glory, there's a corporate piece on that where we come together to worship him and he satiates and he satisfies the the nag of our heart and thereby the corporate witness is real. But then the last one, I got to lift this up, is service. When we serve him, we experience the glory. Jesus went about doing good all through John, all through the gospels. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And we're in a day where Christians are looking to be served rather than serve. And I get it that the church ought to be a place of ministry where we serve people that come through the doors. We ought to serve their needs and we ought to minister to them because we are a chosen priesthood. We ought to do all that. But understand, God calls us to serve, and it's when we serve him, we experience the glory of God. We experience the power of God. We experience his presence when we serve him. I know the the catchphrase today is that we ought to give back to our community. And nothing wrong with that. We ought to give back if God has been good to us. But I came from a culture that went back. We didn't just give back. We went back. We had the spirit of Nehemiah, though he was working in corporate America, he was concerned about his brothers in the hood because the hood was broken down and he went back and tried to make a difference. I I came from the community of people like Harriet Tubman with that new movie coming out, Harriet, that when she got out of slavery, she wasn't going to just be comfortable up in the north, but she went back and got some folk and brought them out. I come from the culture of Frederick Douglass who went to Europe and had a prolific uh, speaking career. But when he heard of the suffering of his people in America, he came back to danger. I come from the culture of Martin Luther King Jr. who could have stayed in his comfort, Boston University academia, but went back to Montgomery to make a difference. I come from the loins of Josephine Kimbrough who went back to her community and built a school. We ought to be a people that goes back to help those who can't help themselves. Not enough just to come on Sunday morning, church. The glory shows up when we bless somebody else. And so I want to give an ode here to Elijah Cummings, who served and he died this past, what, a week ago Friday, and served his district for more than 20 years. And I'm not saying he's the perfect politician. I'm not trying to even push uh, people one way politically, even though I don't like this current political stream, amen. But I will say this, the reason why I lift him up is because the way I read it is that even though he had risen to heights of political power, he kept his resident in his district because he said he never wanted to lose touch of the people. And I'm not saying you can't live in nice places. If God blesses you to do that, please do that. We need you to do that. We need you to go into the places where black people are not welcome or people of brown color are not welcome. We need you to live there. But don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget that the same God that opened doors for you, you ought to try to open doors for somebody else. And that's when the glory will rest on this place. 
And so that's the presence of God. Number, number two, glory signifies his presence. Let me wrap this up. Number three, y'all looking at me like you're a little tired. Number three, glory signifies the witness. And that's why I gave you John 1 and 6, where it says, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He was the witness. People got the wrong questions here. Say, if God's real, show me a miracle, God. If God is real, part the heavens. God, if you're real, do something miraculous. No, the miracle is me. The miracle is you. (laughs) The miracle is what God has done in your life. The miracle is what God has done in my life. We're the witness. Matter of fact, we use that phrase, we we, want to give glory to God. To give glory to God is to be a witness for him. To give glory to God is to make God known. To to make his name known. God told Moses in Exodus 9, he didn't understand it. He says, you're doing all these plagues and you're wiping all these Egyptians out. He says, that's because I need to make my name known. I want the world to know how great I am. And so God does the same thing with his church. He does it with his people. He saved us to make him known, to glorify him, to be a witness. And I'm not talking about Auntie's witness on Wednesday night where she tell a little story that you've heard 20 times. Amen. No, I'm talking about the witness of compassion and the witness of grace. I'm talking about the witness of good. We live in a day the culture's not asking whether or not Christianity is true. They want to know, is it good? And Paul says in Romans 12 and 2, he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it is, that you may prove it is good. That it's good. And I think people are rightfully asking the right question. Is the church good? I know you say it's true, but is it good for me? Is it good for my family? Is it good for my soul? It's it's not enough just to say, we know, most in culture know Jesus is good. The question is, has his goodness rubbed off on us? And so we're called to be a witness. And our witness shows up in many ways. It shows up in our worship. It shows up in our ministry. It shows up in the good we do. It shows up in all that we represent. And so we are like John the Baptist. We're the light that goes before him. And that's my word. In light of all this stuff that's happened this week, and I know we're in a crazy environment politically, I heard that what, there was another shooting in Greenville, folk then lost their mind. They need to know is God real? And we, the church, we have that opportunity to prove to the world that yes, he's real. And not only is he real, but he's also good. And so we're called to be a witness for the Lord. And I don't know about you, y'all. I've been serving the Lord for quite some time, but I made up my mind. (laughs) I didn't know if y'all can even come to church to say, I'm be honest with you. Church been racked and said, well, I'll I'll just come back when they get church open again. (laughs) So I didn't know if y'all was going to come to church or not, but I made up my mind when I go in that Richardson Center. I don't need to hear the Hammond organ, and I love a Hammond organ, Doc. I ain't going to lie. I, I, I'm glad to hear the bass today, Reggie. I ain't going to lie. I don't need to hear the drums. I don't need to hear a certain song. I made up my mind. God's been too good to me, and I'm going to give him the praise. I'm going to bless him no matter what because I'm a witness. I ain't always got it together, but guess what? I'm an example of his grace. And I'm going to stand and be an example. And if I can help somebody find their way, that's going to be my witness. And so if I can close it this way, I close it like this. I saw this story of a young woman who had tremendous gifts as an actress. And she was trying to get an interview with Tyler Perry. And she couldn't get an interview, couldn't get an interview. Everything she tried, she tried her network, tried to go through her agent, couldn't get an interview tried to go through some different avenues or what have you, couldn't get that interview, couldn't sit down. She knew, if I get before this man, I know he'll hire me, put me in one of his movies. And everything she tried, it didn't work. And so finally she said, I gotta do something dramatic. I gotta do something radical. She purchased a billboard sign on the freeway that Tyler Tyler Perry travels. And on the billboard, she says, Mr. P- she put, Mr. Perry, my name is so-and-so, and if you give me a shot, I will make your movies huge. He was so impressed 
that this woman would actually take an ad on a billboard to get her witness out to Tyler Perry that he gave her an interview and she has a role in one of his upcoming movies all because she was willing to be a billboard. And I said, Lord, that's my story. <laughs> I'm willing to be a billboard for you. Do I have any billboards in the house today? Are there any billboards in the house? Anybody willing to be a witness for God? Then stand up and give God some praise today. Somebody say thank you in this house. Would you be a billboard today? Would you be a billboard today? Would you say thank you? Would you say hallelujah? Would you bless him? He's good, church. He's good, church. He's good, church. He's good, church. I'm a billboard for Jesus every day of my life. I will stand for him and be a witness. And that's when God's glory falls. And with the glory comes his blessing. Father, we bless you and thank you for your word. Thank you for this worship. We even thank you for what you're doing in the storm. We don't always understand it, but we trust you. We know you got it in hand. And Lord, we, we believe that in the midst of it, your power will fall with your glory. And Lord, we've made up our minds. We're going to be a billboard today. We're going to be a witness. And we believe you're going to hold us up. And lift up anybody that was touched by the tornado today. Want to make sure you know we'll help you. But more than that, God is on your side. He'll turn it around. Just trust him. He'll turn it around. Your latter will be better than your former. He'll do that. He'll do that. See that vision. Your latter will be better than your former. Some of you.